I'm going to talk today about the engagement of, of architects with society. I, I have a strong belief that architects um, should not only be designers, but also should uh, share their expertise um, in the built environment, design, and the understanding of culture in our built environment uh, to achieve other aims and goals as well, and thereby to achieve greater architecture. So, um, hence the relevance of this first uh, image. And uh, moving on from there, we, I do believe that the design, good design is diverse design, is, is not a ubiquitous solution um, for the whole world. And I think over the last uh, decade or so, we've seen the advent of ubiquitous solutions that are applied to cities across the, the entire world, be they the North American model for an office building or a architect's uh, design branded solution, uh, which may be has a relevance in some cities for some purposes, but not necessarily for all cities for all purposes. So I do question this notion about uh, spreading out branded solutions across the world. And, and as a result of that, uh, we at IDAS, we have, we have over 25 offices throughout the world, and that's not in order to be big, but that's in order to be appropriate. It's in order that the designs that we're creating are appropriate to the cities that we're creating those designs for, for the countries we're creating those designs for. Which means that we place our designers into every city that we're creating a design for, and we move our specialist designers to the city, as opposed to taking the design problem back to New York or London or Tokyo or wherever is home. We don't have a home. We're sort of a, a homeless society of architects at Idas. We just uh, inhabit other people's homes like cuckoos and design for them. So what does that lead to? Well, I'm going to give you a few examples of what I mean so you have a better understanding of it. Um, here we've got a view of Central. This is a little exercise that I did about 10 years ago. Of course, we had the mid-levels escalator here in, in Hong Kong built. And we had Lang Kwai Fong. And we had a very interesting series of footbridges in Central for Hong Kong land. And then we had the new IFC uh, development. Now, it, you, you can actually track from IFC and the Old Star Ferry right through Exchange Square, uh, up through Cheddar House, Prince's Building, all on footbridges, all above ground. So we all know about that. But um, the next step was to think, well, what would happen if we went on from Central up to Lang Kwai Fong? And again, there's a route that we probably all know in Hong Kong but you can actually go up Wyndham Street, sneak through a little lane, up on Unland Street, and then you can come up to the Centrium and use a set of escalators. And then we come to, to the Central Police Station. This exercise was done before the Central Police Station work was starting. And what we identified was that the Central Police Station affords a series of cross routes that would link Lang Kwai Fong to Soho. And then from Soho down the mid-levels escalators all the way back again. So I called it the Golden Bracelet. It's about two kilometer walk, and it links up um, all the important areas of Hong Kong, both in terms of time, from very new buildings through to, to 80s buildings and 60s buildings, and then all the way up to 19th century buildings, and then back down again. And again, of course, picking up the central market. So that sort of exercise is important. It's not an exercise that an international architect could carry out, because he wouldn't understand the city that he's actually designing for. So I would say that that's a good reason that architects need to be relevant locally as well as internationally. Here's another one. This is a very small one, and this is something we did about three years ago. This is a beach um, called Big Wave Bay Beach, which is one of the few surf beaches in Hong Kong. And there had been a, a typhoon, Typhoon Hagu Pit, that had uh, destroyed the sand dunes or pulled away the sand from the base of some trees. But there was a beautiful natural habitat there and a very delicate ecosystem. But the CDD's uh, idea, the Civil Dep uh, Engineering Department's idea, was to 
build a two meter wave wall across the back of the beach. Well, of course, what that would do would stop the cycle of sand being blown into the river and then being carried down into the beach and maintaining a flat and level beach, which creates surf. So if that wall had been built, we'd have lost one of our last surviving surf beaches. So again, um, it's something that we felt that we should get involved in. As we should get involved with, with our community, you know, what else can architects do? Well, we're designers, we can draw, we can help children learn how to draw, we can engage with disadvantaged people, we can use our staff uh, to carry out that engagement. Um, we also understand the arts, so we can get involved with the arts in each of our cities. This is in Hong Kong. And of course, architects have space, so we can give space to people to carry out their activities, so we give space to the city chamber orchestra as well. This is a very old exercise, though it seems to have come back into prominence. Around, um, it was about 1998, I suppose, so about, um, it was a few years ago, isn't it? Um, 15 years ago, I, I was increasingly worried about the way that Hong Kong wasn't developing into a first world city in its usage of space and in terms of the size of apartments for most of the people in Hong Kong. So we had a few year out students and I asked them to, to plot out what land we had built on in Hong Kong. And of course we had some relevant government statistics which are now well known, but remember this is 15 years ago, that 35% of our land was country park and 35% was scrub land and 25% was built upon and only 8% was built upon for residential. So I thought, well, that's an interesting series of statistics. Let's just compare that to uh, Singapore. And uh, I found that Singapore had built on 70% of its land, so three times more, and had used 24% of its land for residential as opposed to 8%. And not surprisingly, Singapore apartments are twice the size of Hong Kong apartments and the density of um, Singapore apartments is uh, three to one as opposed to nine to one in Hong Kong. And here's some of the photographs those good students took of some of the development opportunities. Um, and we drew a quick map about, well, what would happen if we could increase the amount of land from 8% to 24% for residential? Where would we find that land? And here we find it in those increased patches from, of red from that to that, not beyond the wit of man, but seemingly beyond the politics of Hong Kong. Um, and that's what it means in reality. On the left is Hong Kong density, uh, average size of apartment 50 to 60 square meters, and on the right is a typical Singapore de development of three to one plot ratio and average size of apartment 110 square meters, double that size. So this is not work which um, we either get paid for or is indeed relevant to creating buildings, but it's work to do with our society. I'm going to flick through some, some work, and, and each of these projects is as a result of deep involvement in our society. Um, this is the North Satellite Terminal at the airport, and it, as you, most people here probably know, they've used it, it mostly for, for planes through to China. Um, this is an MTR station. We do many, many MTR stations, um, not just in Hong Kong. But I think the, this is Meifu, and it's embedded into a park. And I think the understanding of Meifu Park and the use of Meifu Park is intrinsic to the way that this design is carried out. School. Um, St. Paul's co-ed up on the hill there. And China Construction Bank headquarters. Um, which was an exercise together with the adjacent AIA in reducing the podium impact, reducing from 100% side coverage podium and putting that extra area into the tower. So instead of a 65% coverage tower, we have an 80% coverage tower. And trying to break down these regulations that we have in each of our cities by asking simple questions about, well, what was that regulation for? And can we modulate it in some way? Uh, this is the new express rail link uh, into China from, from Kowloon. And the concept here is that as you come out of the train, you can see the peak of Hong Kong. So you can see um, that uh, skyline 
peak skyline of Hong Kong. So everybody arriving in Hong Kong will know that they've come here, even from the platforms down below. And I think that that's just really something coming from living in Hong Kong. What is the most important experience you'd want to have as you arrive? In Singapore, uh, this is the Star Performing Arts Center. In Singapore, it's a 5,000 seat theater on top of a shopping center. Not many people understand that in Singapore, uh, you don't really need to keep your air conditioner on, even in, in your apartment, even though the temperature is 30 to 32 degrees. Because the hot side of the building, Singapore buildings face, uh, apartments face south-north, the hot side is about two or three degrees cooler than the north side, and that promotes uh, a wind velocity through the apartments if you open windows both sides. Uh, so we use that to design an open-air shopping centre underneath this theatre. And this is, uh, this is Lucas Films headquarters in Singapore. Um, and that little uh, garden inside the U-shape is just a delightful place for lunch for the office workers and to hang out. And, and again, promoting wind and air movement of about two to three knots, not very much, but that little movement of air created by the heat of the building is sufficient to keep people cool. The same idea at Marina Bay Station, promoting wind movement to keep people cool in the station. And again, uh, residential, large decks for people to enjoy an indoor-outdoor environment. All of these are local solutions. They may look like international buildings, but they've applied local solutions. Vietnam, Saigon Tower, using local materials and artisans to create a grade-A office building. In Indonesia, creating uh, an urban park, an oasis uh, in the very, very busy metropolis. Thailand, a, a building that was designed in 1988 when shopping was started in Thailand, that has since gone through four makeovers and is now a name brand center. And the idea behind that was the planning was so flexible that it could adopt through time into a number of different usages. And in Dubai, the, the iconic, now it's become iconic, they're called the cockroaches, the 48 stations for Dubai that link up uh, all the various uh, important sites in D Dubai and go hand in hand with a land utilization diagram and a master plan for Dubai of how we can use uh, Dubai's land to the best of uh, our ability. And that idea was unashamedly taken from the MTRC in Hong Kong. The way that the MTRC use lands, uh, uses air rights to fund the railway program and captures added value to its developments. And this is exactly what we were pursuing in Dubai. Uh, how to twist a tower to get better views. And over to the UK, uh, I just dropped this one in. This is a new school that we've just completed in London and the concept of community within a private educational school and applying high-rise uh, development skills of the Asia uh, to the Western world, to, to, to the UK, where they're not normally met. And the whole idea here is that we move our designers to the problem. So rather than taking the problem back to London or to New York, the designer moves to Manchester to create a design that's appropriate for Manchester, but uses international skills learned from the other side of the globe. Beijing, 14 Plaza Beijing, borrowed heavily from Hong Kong design skills. RNF City, on the other hand, borrowed heavily from European design skills of creating parks at the ground level for a high density environment. In Shanghai, TG Harbor View, similarly, we brought in European designers uh, for the parks at the base. They were, of course, using Hong Kong designers for the towers. And uh, similarly for Shanghai New Ridge Tower. Su Zhao, this is, this is a very interesting example of uh, design coming together from across the globe, not just from the designers, but also from the owners. This is Liverpool University in Su Zhao, creating a building where we use designers from Manchester and designers from uh, Beijing and Hong Kong to create a unique building that was appropriate for Suzhou and also appropriate for the building user. 
and Chongqing. I'm not sure why we've chosen this to represent Chongqing, but there we go. Um, a shopping center over nine levels coming in at four different levels and uh, picking up the theme of the rocks of Chongqing uh, within the overall design. So if design is about uh, international expertise, it's also about local knowledge. It's also about government and the developer and the user. The international aspect of it can touch the developer and the user, but it rarely touches the community and the government. And the process of creating a building, the design stage is about 30% of the actual work, whilst the construction documents and the administration comprises about 65%. So again, that would support the argument that the work is a lot more than pure design. It's about local understanding and local engagement as well. So let's take two examples to close off because I think I'm running out of time here. Very quickly, let's look at the centers of central Hong Kong. These are the footbridge systems in Hong Kong. They connect up a series of buildings, Hong Kong lands buildings, 12 buildings with a series of footbridges. Um, you probably know them all. We've got... Uh, Exchange Square, and then Jardine House, Cheda House, Alexandra House, Princess Building, and the Landmark. And here's what Princess Building looked like uh, through until the late 80s. It was uh, a building for banking. And uh, it's never been taken down. It was built in the, in the 60s. So it's a great example of sustainability that this building, this building frame has been adopted many times. That's what it looks like today. It's gone through three different design phases to get to this point because back in the 80s, that is, the name brands didn't exist, but slowly the name brands have become more and more powerful, and so they've taken over the facade of the building. Inside, the Princess Building is a very important building. It links up to many other buildings, and it's right opposite Legco. And when we made it over, we created an axis to LegCo with a drum in the center to provide a greater legibility from the old plan. And then we allowed the walkways to be visible from each other where before they were concealed, and we gave the building a new lease of life. And over time, we've remade the interiors two or three times, so now they've got their final makeover, or current makeover. Landmark, the same. Here's the... Uh, the 90s version of Landmark. Here's a new version of Landmark where the name brands uh, adopt uh, the corners and the facades and create their own facades, and we project manage that process. Again, Landmark linking through with bridges to the other developments. And here, I was walking down the street of Queen's Road one day, and I was wondering why the tenants at Landmark at the back end of Queen's Road were, was a bank and a... Uh, and the restaurant, when in fact it was a prime frontage. So we proposed to Hong Kong Land that they put the drop-off in that is currently there and create a new link through to the atrium to open up the entire side of the building. Well, I'd, I'd argue that can only be done with local knowledge. You cannot do that type of move to a building uh, uh, without local knowledge. And there's the drop-off, uh, which of course is together with the hotel and Harvey Nichols and all the food and beverage is completely uh, recreated uh, a new image for, for Landmark. Swai so House, of course, it was a redevelopment, not a, not a, a, a restoration. And, again, and this, is, this is Giorgio Armani's land, a mio casa, as he calls it. And here it was working with Giorgio Armani uh, with the understanding of the connectivity of this building and the local community to, to create um, a new retail center, which is dedicated routes of three bridges through the first floor, connecting the entire place up, but still branding it as, as Amani's world. And Alexandra House, this is what it used to look like up until uh, the late 90s. Uh, escalators every corner, no retail presence whatsoever with the walkway around the inside. And now, of course, you have strong retail presence and the, the walkway route has been taken through the center. Quite a simple diagram. 
Escalators on the outside with the walkway around the outside is fairly wasteful. Get rid of three sets of escalators, one set of escalators, create an axis that goes through to Prince's building and through to LegCo, makes the whole place coherent, and provide large windows so you can orientate yourself through this building, which at one point in time was just a complete nightmare uh, for people to orientate their way around. And then give the corners over where the escalators were, give the corners over to Brandy. Finally, the forum, and then I'm going to stop. I won't do the last project. I'm going to stop on this project. Um, the forum uh, in Exchange Square was a fairly uh, heavyweight building that wasn't used very well, but a very, very important space because IFC, having, having opened, um, it seemed that that building was occupying what could become a very important public plaza and a very important movement space for the people of Hong Kong. Um, so it seemed to me that what we needed to create was a very transparent building and one that sat as an object within a public plaza as opposed to a building that borrowed from the architecture of the, of, of the buildings around it and created an obstruction. Um, the building's now finished, so you can test whether I got that right or not. And uh, there it sits in that urban urbanity. And it sits within a plaza, which will be finished very shortly, with a rich collection of sculptures and water features, which will create a new place and park for Hong Kong. That's it. Thank you very much. I was interested in your, your point about a global firm such as Ada's being able to deploy knowledge from one place and skills or skills from one place into another place. You made the example of the skills from Manchester being applied in China and vice versa. Mm. What are the local or native skills and knowledge of Hong Kong? How would you articulate that? Okay. Um, actually, Hong Kong has a, has a huge amount of skills and experience in, in a variety of building types. Um, first of all, the obvious ones. We've got high-density high residential. Uh, mixed commercial, and mix, the mixed commercial diagram came from Hong Kong. That's where it emanates from. The whole idea of putting a shopping center, re residential, hotel, office, all together into one urbanity, into one form and shape, and enjoying and maximizing the connectivity between those. And it's a very Hong Kong solution. It's being developed now in China and exceeded in China, uh, but it comes from Hong Kong. The, the transport-orientated development approach of the MTRC of bringing in um, a railway system with a bus station, uh, integrating all of that with a massive mixed commercial development is another skill that we have in Hong Kong. And then finally, of course, the high-rise residential. So, so those are the particular aspects that we've developed in Hong Kong um, that uh, we are very, very used to indeed. And that's what we've taken into, into China and now developing China. I think one of the challenges that we have in Hong Kong is how do we maintain our original leadership in those design skills. Because right now, uh, China is taking those a step further in an appropriate way for China. Uh, how, how do we uh, continue to develop those skills in, in Hong Kong itself? And I'd argue that what we need to do to do that is be more in China, integrate more into China, that our universities here, both universities teaching architecture, need to integrate more with China as well and uh, uh, the Hong Kong Institute of Architects needs to be more aware that our problem is not Hong Kong, our problem is China, mm. our play field is China. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much.